Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Merry Christmas. This is the first Sunday after Christmas, one of the 12 days of Christmas. Our celebration continues. And as such, we can't contain the joy and the the majesty of the birth of Christ to one single day. But we continue our celebration. Today, though, we're also looking at not only the birth of Jesus the King, but two kings. As we return to the story, chapter 12, we read about the trials of a king. And that king with his trials is King David. But we also remember here on this first Sunday after Christmas, our Lord Jesus Christ, that he is king of all the universe, king of kings and lord of lords, and that he reigns over all. And that he, in fact, reigns over David, and he reigns over us. The stories of Jesus and David are intertwined because Jesus is the great, 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 great grandson of David. And yet he was worshipped by David as his king as well. So Jesus, king of the universe, If the theme for today is the trials of a king, what trials could the king of the universe have? Well, as Jesus becomes incarnate, as he takes on human flesh, he undergoes the trials that any human being would undergo because he has become true man. He is both at the same time 100% divine and 100% human. And so, as a human being coming into this world, there are the trials of being born. The trials of being laid in that manger so humble. Though he is a king, the king of the universe, few, if any, would recognize him simply by judging from the circumstances. The trials of this king, that he is dependent on every drop of milk from his mother, and needs to be cared for for every diaper change. And on the 40th day, presented at the temple, given over to the Lord, in a sense, as the firstborn, although he is the Lord, and a sacrifice is made. What trials could this one have? Jesus said one time, the foxes have holes, The birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. The trials of this king would include that moment, that hour of trial, where his friends would be sleeping. That time of trial where a friend would betray him with a kiss. That moment when his disciples would flee being judged by others, including Pontius Pilate, he would be asked, are you a king? And Jesus would say that if his legions of angels wanted to fight for him and he would allow it, they would certainly do battle. But this king, Jesus, goes to the cross and he suffers and in some ways that is his coronation at the cross for there he takes his place and he reigns he dies but he comes back to life and now he reigns forevermore at the right hand of God the Father This is our king. What trials could he have? None of his own making, but of his own choosing to undergo these trials for you and for me. And then we have chapter 12 of the story. 
King David, the great king over all Israel. Anything that he may ask of the Lord, the Lord likely would provide. And David has his trials that we read about in chapter 12. What is the source of the trials that David faces? It is his own frailty, his own flaws, his own choices, and suffering the consequences. David chooses to take to himself another man's wife, Bathsheba, and when she becomes pregnant, he decides that he needs to do something to cover up his own tracks. Ultimately, that leads him to set up Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband, for a downfall at the front of battle. David is confronted with his sin through the prophet Nathan. And when confronted, David is cut to the heart because he recognizes that his sin, his own sin, through his own fault, he has broken the relationship with his God. David then pens perhaps the greatest confession that we could ever have modeling for us in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. All sin is done in the sight of God. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Original sin, inherited from our parents. Yet you desired faithfulness, even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. His iniquity was blotted out with the blood of Christ. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Nathan the prophet declares to David, your sins have been forgiven. And yet there are consequences that David experiences as a result of his sin. The child born to Bathsheba, David's son, dies. Another son violates a granddaughter of David's. Another son rebels against his father, Absalom. And David is cut to the heart. And after all of these trials, David is delivered. And he continues to reign and becomes even more so a unifying force in all of Israel for Judah and the northern section of Israel as they align themselves under this king that God has given them, David. David, as king, is yet subject to the king of heaven. In desperate need of God's love and forgiveness, which his great, 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 great grandson would bring about through his death on the cross. And he himself, Jesus, is worshipped by the great King David. As David says, Praise to you, O Lord, the God and the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor 
For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you, and you are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. And David exhorts the people, encourages them to devote their hearts and soul to seeking the Lord, their God. How about you and me? It's so difficult, I think, for us living in a society where our, effect, our officials are elected. And so we have kind of a, an optional allegiance to those who execute justice in our land. They don't reign over us. So it might be hard for us to understand what it is to be under the reign of a king. Jesus is our king. He is our deliverer. And he is the one who reigns over us. What does that mean? It means for us that we seek to align our lives with his. We follow him. He calls us to follow after him, to take up our cross and follow him, to crucify those parts of our lives that are according to our sinful flesh, to put to death that which does not align with God's will and his power, and instead to be made alive through Jesus' power, his death and his resurrection become ours. Because in baptism, we are buried with him in his death. And so we will also be made alive in a resurrection like his. And his resurrected life is already at work in us from the day we are joined with him in baptism. Jesus, our king, reigns. Though the world does not recognize him, perhaps things aren't so different from when Jesus was a baby and when Jesus grew up in his day where people might not recognize him or acknowledge him as the great king of all heaven and earth. Perhaps people do not see that today. But as our lives align with Jesus, as we continue to follow Jesus, as we love in the way that Jesus loved, unconditionally, spending ourselves sacrificially on the part of our neighbor, our lives then reflect the reign of Jesus. And in some way, God may give us opportunity to extend his reign into the lives of others through our deeds and through our words. For under the reign of this king, there's protection. There's safety. There's protection from the evil one. And even defense against the foe called death. For as Pastor Grandpa reminds us always, Good Friday is always followed by... He is our defender... He is the one who gives us life. And as we live under him in his kingdom, we serve him willingly. As his servants, we have opportunity to demonstrate our thankfulness. Just as David, in his words of praise for God, demonstrates the thankfulness both he and the people have, God opens our lips and our mouths declare his praise. Our lives demonstrate the power of his life. And our hope is found in him alone. We go back to the cradle. The manger. Which served as the cradle for Jesus. And we kneel there during this time of Christmas as a way of paying homage to our King, the one who comes to save us. 
and the one who comes to shower us with the gifts of God's love, his mercy, and his peace forever. In Jesus' name, amen.